you everyone for joining us. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning from wherever you're joining us from. My name is Anita Makori, and I'm very happy to host our webinar this week. And we have with us Dr. Alice Matimba, who is the Head of Training and Global Capacity at Welcome Connecting Science. And she's also the executive producer at with the you, Your Digital Mentor podcast. And she's a lot more than that, but we'll get to hear more from her once we start our conversation. Just to remind you that if you have any question along the way, you can write them on the chat or just hold on to the question and we'll have a session where we have a Q&A with our guest and you'll be able to ask, um, unmute yourself and ask your question. But for now, I would like to request Alice to please introduce yourself to our audience, just mainly focusing on your academic and career background. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Um, uh, it is a, really an honor to be on this podcast and, um, and, and giving me a chance to actually talk about myself. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really looking forward to um, engaging with, uh, with those that are on, on uh, listening on the call and also engaging with you, Anita, and, and sharing my experiences uh, in my academic and um, professional career path. Um, so I am Alice Matimba, and I um, uh, I'm I'm based at the Welcome Connecting Science, which is um, uh, which is based at the Welcome Genome Campus in the south of Cambridge. I'm the head of the training uh, program where we develop courses uh, primarily focused on genomic sciences, uh, and I'm also a, a big, um, a very passionate about capacity building and primarily focused on developing skills or enhancing skills of research and healthcare professionals so that they can apply genomics in their work. Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, so although I'm currently here in the UK, I've been here um, for the last seven years. Um, I am actually uh, originally from Zimbabwe. Uh, and from there, I did my undergraduate studies in biochemistry. Uh, at the University of Zimbabwe. And in fact, that's where all my uh, interest in going into the academic world and in research uh, came about. Um, I had a very good uh, supervisor mentor who made science uh, seem like an interesting field to follow. So after that, I decided to do a master's uh, um, program. So I did, a, I did my master's program and I was very curious. So I decided to go abroad. And so I did my master's in Belgium in molecular biology, which was a very intense program. Uh, and that's where I started to really appreciate, uh, you know, uh, meeting people from different cultures, different backgrounds. Um, and it was an international program. Uh, but the program itself really got me even more interested in, in uh, molecular biology. And this was in the early 2000s. So this is the time when the human genome was um, yeah, completing, being sequenced. And so genomics was actually starting to become a big thing. And I got really interested in some of those um, achievements that were happening all over the world. And uh, when I finished my master's, I thought, well, what could I do in that field that would um, uh, be focused a lot more on uh, bringing genomics, doing genomics for African populations? So I was, so I was really, um, so I was really lucky to uh, find um, find a team that was actually working on uh, understanding genetic variation of um, uh, genetic variation in genes that uh, encode uh, drug metabolism, drug metabolizing enzymes. So uh, and they were interested primarily on doing this and understanding the variation in African populations. So my PhD, uh, I started my PhD and I was again lucky enough to get a small uh, fund, uh, a, a research grant, uh, which allowed me to work with a team in, in, in Antwerp, in, in, in the University of Antwerp, to start my, um, to do my PhD way. I was uh, characterizing uh, the genes that are uh, in um, drug response pathways um, to understand uh, variation across uh, 
African populations in five countries in, in Africa. So that was really, um, felt really, really good to be able to do something like that in collaborating with people from the continent. So um, so I, so this was really uh, something I was passionate about and I really wanted to be part of the, you know, groups of people that were trying to bring genomics to Africa. And so I, I started off thinking about doing some kind of um, developing a repository of, uh, of samples which could then be used to do, um, to, you know, conduct sequencing and also um, analyze uh, variants in these populations. So my very first paper, which I published, was actually a uh, biobank of uh, African populations, which would be used for uh, conducting pharmacogenomic studies for African populations. And so at that time, that was such a big deal um, because uh, there were very few studies that were focusing on African genomics. So, um, so let's say fast forward. I um, I then you know had a um, had a very uh, good experience in in at the University of Antwerp. I then moved to University of Cape Town, where I finished off my um, my PhD. Um, but I was also then curious to sort of uh, further this work in pharmacogenomics. So I went to um, I went to do my postdoc in the United States at the Mayo Clinic, which was also really um, a fantastic experience because it allowed because you can imagine that, you know, when you work in you know certain environments where you have resources, um, you can do a whole lot more and uh, and have more questions that you you have enough resources to interrogate a lot more questions. So my work there was um, very much lab lab based and uh, focused on um, uh, functional understanding function func func function uh, of um, functional impact on function of um, uh, uh, genes that are involved in drug metabolism pathways. So again, building on this, but the, the idea was to um, do this using cell line model systems. So this would then allow us to understand what the impact of certain variants may have on certain um, gene expression or gene function. Um, and so this actually took me, this was actually really interesting in understanding how this can also be translated um, within a clinical context. So we worked on a cohort that was focusing primarily on um, on cancer, on treat treatment ca of cancers, um, and then this this um, sort of made me think: Well, what what could I do with all this knowledge that I've gained from being um, in these wonderful places that I've been in different parts of the world? So I was I felt motivated to you know to go back to Zimbabwe, in fact, to contribute to the um, to the wave of you know, building up genomics in Africa that was happening or starting up in the late uh, 2000s, uh, early, you know, early uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. And so I, I, um, so I, I you know, I, I went back and, you know, my goal was I'm going to, I'm going to go back. I want to start up my own research group. Uh, so I joined the university as a lecturer, and as you know, you this probably the easiest, the best way to get into university is to be a lecturer because you can't, you usually don't have the luxury of just being a research scientist and having and dedicating all your time to that. So I did manage to sort of like balance that out. So being a lecturer in clinical pharmacology, uh, and a lot of my, you know, obviously still my focus was around um, drug. Drug, uh, drug response and looking at genetics, genomics. Uh, and so I started collaborating with some of the uh, scientists within the university. Um, but then I also was very much, uh, you know, you know, looking, looking forward to understanding what are some of the needs in terms of research locally. So um, I, I, and I did come across, I, I did identify some gaps um, in terms of research in general, so nothing to do with genomics, but just understanding that even if I do want to do genomics research, uh, I need, I would need to have access to um, what you call sort of cohorts, you know, or, um, uh, you know, 
the people that um, would have, say, for example, I was interested in non-communicable diseases at the time. So, um, so having access or to collaborate with, you know, clinical centers that would have uh, people that you could enroll into studies. And I quickly realized that um, a lot of the studies that were taking place were focused on infectious diseases and that if you wanted to do, you know, studies in other diseases, you're going to have to start developing new cohorts and, and, and getting that. So there was a big gap in that sense. Um, but while doing that, I also, you know, it, it, you know, it was clear that the resources that are supposed to be there to support people that are suffering from non-communicable diseases were limited. And um, at that time, I was looking specifically at diabetes. And um, uh, and I, you know, when started talking to people that, you know, at, at the clinics or even some of the, the doctors, um, it came about that a lot of patients were not really being able to access early care um, and there weren't in there wasn't enough uh, there weren't enough resources or infrastructure for people to uh, to be screened actually for some of the really debilitating complications that um, that diabetic patients uh, um, uh, have um, as as the as the disease progresses. So um, so and to me it sounded like this is a very simple fix. Well, why can't why can't we um, develop tools that um, or processes that allow the uh, the the the, team, the the clinical teams to be able to uh, screen patients, say for diabetic um, for their eyes in terms of diabetic retinopathy, which is a major debilitating uh, condition, as well as diabetic foot. And um, and so I put all my other sort of transferable skills uh, into play and, um, and ident and, uh, identified some people whom I could collaborate with both in Zimbabwe and abroad, uh, put together a couple of proposals to international organizations to look for funding that would enable us to either purchase equipment that would enable us to, to do that or to, um, to actually conduct some just basic studies to understand how those processes could be improved. So fast forward a couple of years later, we had actually established a very nice screening program for the eyes so that patients would, in their routine visits with the doctors at, a host at the hospitals, they would be able to actually also get uh, eye care. So we had a project that was around teleophthalmology at the time. It was really fascinating because you, that's the time where you had a lot of mobile, you know, using mobile technology to, um, to take uh, sort of images of the eyes and then have those images uh, read by a specialist. Um, so without them having to book an appointment to go to a center where they had these, you know, sort of like equipment which which couldn't be moved, you could actually just have a very, you know, gadget, a camera gadget that you could actually use to do that. So. Um, so we got funding to do that and we then um, actually got funding to then uh, develop a uh, to to set up. So if we were screening all these people and identify and uh, and and getting them um, and and getting and they get diagnosed of of uh, say diabetic neuropathy or any other uh, conditions, um, what are you doing about us? And this is the question that came about because obviously um, we had to do something. So again, put my problem solving hat on together with my collaborators, and we went out again and looked for more funding that would enable us to. Um, purchase a, a mobile uh, equipment that allows uh, that can be moved around and be used to treat people. So this to me, and this was just one of the projects and the other projects was actually around screening for diabetic foot. Um, and this was oh, we allow we did some training to for nurses uh, and uh, and worked with uh, my colleagues at the University of Zimbabwe to uh, deliver workshops to for nurses and for 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 uh, doctors as well, so that this can be put into routine practice. So I did my fair share of, uh, you know, sort of using whatever skills or knowledge and, you know, just passion I had around finding solutions for uh, which could implement, could be implemented or influence uh, some of the public health systems, because 
there is, aren't shortage of problems in, as you know, in Africa. So you are, you know, we really need to have a lot more people, so scientists coming back and uh, innovating and, and and finding solutions that are beneficial for, um, you know, for the patients there. So fast forward uh, all this, I was already doing some teaching. I was actually got really fascinated in the um, in, in, in the sort of like the world of education and, and training development focused obviously on healthcare professionals and I was already teaching in the medical school so I under and I took a, I was uh, took a, a course a training around education health education development um, which actually then got me even more interested in going into uh, thinking always thinking about how do we solve problems how do we build skills how do we build capacity so that uh, we can um, we can improve healthcare. We can improve people's lives. We can understand uh, more in terms of just research, more or biology. So this, uh, after a couple of uh, years being at the University of Zimbabwe, I actually um, I got an opportunity to go to to do a clinic a training in clinical trial and clinical uh, trial management in my uh, in clinical develop uh, um, clinical research uh, development, and my idea was actually to learn how clinical trials work, uh, but at the same time, how can we incorporate genomics um, into um, some of the clinical trials that were that are usually sort of like taking place in either in anywhere, right? So, for example, at the time, there weren't that many clinical trials. Uh, there are less clinical. There aren't that many sort of like well set up clinical trials that were taking place in Africa or skilled people that are doing it in in um, in Africa. So I was one of the people that um, was part of a, a cohort that was funded by a European. Uh, development trials, something clinical trials program, EDCTP. And um, and so my idea was actually to bring back, to come back and try to think about how do you set up a, uh, almost like a pipeline of, um, uh, you know, that would enable us to either collect samples, collect data, uh, and come up with a way that um, doctors can use some of that information to be able to improve the, you know, to inform treatment and improve the treatment uh, procedures. Uh, unfortunately, that was cut short. Uh, and so I, I, while I was there, I came across an, um, um, an advert that was um, looking for somebody who was interested in developing, in um, uh, expanding uh, the genomics training program, which would be focused on, um, on training people in Africa, Asia, Latin America. And that's how I joined this organization. Uh, because that was exactly what I was really, really interested in building capacity, um, spreading the knowledge, spreading the skills. And so um, since I've been here for seven years, I have, you know, expired the program at the time was a very small program. I've expanded that program. And actually, currently now I um, I'm now the head of the whole program, including the training that we do here in Hingston. Um, and of course, I'm involved in a whole lot of other projects that are, again, focused on training, development, skills development, uh, capacity building, and collaborate with a lot of people internationally. So um, so that's about it. And that's how I got to where I am. Wow, thank you. That is a journey if I ever had one. That is literally a science journey because uh, so you've taken us through um, your undergrad in Zimbabwe and then onto your master's and PhD in Belgium and Cape Town and then onto your postdoc in the United States and then back to Zim teaching and research and then noticing the gaps that exist both in research and in the health system that we are well aware of and wondering what it is that you can do to play your part in pushing the needle in solving those problems and then coming back full circle to uh, an opportunity that enables you to give back in the in the best way that you can back to the continent and to other continents as well. So yeah. um, I think there are many places I can pick to I can choose to unpack and before we go on to your current role um, I would like to ask um, so 
as you as you as you've taken us through your journey and the different positions you've held and the different lessons you've learned i was just wondering um you, you mentioned some mentors along the way and the role of mentorship in guiding you but i was just wondering if you had challenges and how you were able to navigate those challenges and how you were able to come from them and then find your next step in this journey and how that was for you yeah Yes, so that's a that's a good um, good question, and I have to be honest. Um, I had some really good uh, mentors at the beginning of my science career. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, obviously they moved on, and then I moved on. Um, but for the longest time, um, I did not really have uh, a mentor as such. I mean, I uh, I think what I did is I I never stopped looking. Yeah, so and some of it is actually reflected in the fact that I was doing this and I was doing that. I was doing that and so many other things that I actually didn't talk about in my journey that I've just uh, mentioned to you. So I found the challenge that I then I found myself dabbling in so many things with uh, not, not I mean, I felt like I had no direction. I was experimenting. I was uh, talking to a lot of people and trying to find my niche. I knocked on doors looking for people, asking people if they could mentor me. And quite often, no one won, no, no one was um, sort of like forthcoming about that, which is interesting and surprising, I'm sure you would imagine. Um, and there were so many other challenges in that. A lot of the, especially when I was back in, 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 in Zimbabwe, is that there were very few people that would have had my background, the background or the scientific background and the uh, expertise that I was trying to you know build for myself so not many people would have had that so um so i focused a lot on getting uh, you know looking for just you know self building myself um i did have quite a lot of good peer mentors so i had people that were also around like my also seeking looking for stuff sharing and so I really concentrated a lot of my energy on creating those peer relationships um, where I could I could learn if it was a skill I needed or a tool I needed or just advice on what should I do how do I navigate this um, and then of course in some cases I did have some mentors who really helped me to um, you know, supported me and helped me when I was in trouble. I was in trouble sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so that was really good. I think a lot of us go through that. Um, and uh, and so in, in fact, all these struggles I had in finding a good mentor and, and all that is actually the reason why I um worked with uh, with my colleagues on, on your digital mentor podcast. In fact, that's what was the biggest inspiration was. I don't want others to go through what I went through, the challenges of finding a good mentor, somebody that has the expertise, somebody that um, is interested in you. Um, and of course, you do have supervisors, you do have people that are also, to a large extent, helping you and mentoring you to a large extent. But having that sort of like, um, you know, per person or group of people that you really call, this is my mentor, and I go where they go, they help me, they support me. I think that was a challenge. And understandably, I, I reflected and I realized that sometimes if I didn't, if there were certain people who were not forthcoming in becoming my mentor, it's because they were also inundated and probably mentoring like a hundred other people. So they, you know, so it wasn't really their fault. It's just, you know, the environment was just really uh, difficult. But now that I've been here and I mean, over time, I met a lot of really good people uh, that I develop very strong relationships with. And this is something that I do very well. Um, I, I, I really value, uh, you know, good, positive relationships. And so if you are um, understand that I, and, and I, I took it as every interaction I have with somebody who is professional or who is good at something, I took it as an opportunity to be mentored. So even if I don't directly call that person my mentor, but I did use any opportunity that I could to, you know, get close to people that I felt could help me in my career. And that has actually worked out really well. 
Uh, and so I have a, a very broad network and that has been really, really good. So if you don't have a mentor, don't worry. You know, you can do this in so many different ways. Thank you. Thank you. I think what I appreciate most is one, the vulnerability with which you shared, uh, how you, you tried to get a mentor and how you reached out to people, but sometimes you don't always get, always get the answer you want. And I like that instead of focusing on that, you are able to move on and establish a platform to enable others who may have similar needs so that they can access mentorship in a different way through the podcast. And also, the, you mentioned something that you don't have to call someone your mentor, like officially, for you to learn from them. You can learn from them indirectly, either through conversations with them or even the work they do and drawing inspiration from their work. And I think that's what we have learned, especially from that part. And, and actually, so, to, to, to add to mm -hmm. that, Anita, um, mm -hmm. as, you are, as you are seeking mentorship and guidance and advice, um, Always remember that you, and this is our motto on the um, podcast, on the Your Digital Mentor podcast was um, paying it forward. So it's really important and critical that if you are seeking mentorship, if you're seeking advice, if you're seeking support, that you're also giving back to others. You don't have to give back to the same people, but you must also always wear the cap of yes as a mentee but also as a mentor and ask yourself well, what am i doing with what i've learned how am i giving back to other people and then that network actually grows